So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle King. I'm the Managing Director of Capacity Building International, and welcome once again to one of our webinars, the 2020 web webinar series where we are talking about international models and emergency management. And today we are joined by colleagues from the United Kingdom. And one of the things that uh, before we get started, I want to do just a few administrative remarks and a couple of just really quick introductions. And one of those is the fact that, um, of course, as usual, we are joined here by Harold Drager from Teams, President of Teams. Harold, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Kai. Look forward for this presentation today. Yes, me as well. And then also we're joined by David Powell. Now you might remember David from one of our last uh, collaboration webinars we did at the University of Manchester. And we're joined here again by David who's joining us uh, and is the Principal Advisor in Recovery, Renewal, Resilience and Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute with the University of Manchester. David, good to see you again. Yeah, hi, Kyle. Hi, everybody. Harold, good to see you again. Good and see. just a couple of uh, quick remarks. Harold, did you want to say something again? No, I just want to remind everybody listening that uh, we have a deadline for a peer reviewed paper for Teams uh, annual conference, which takes place 6th to 10th of December. So please go to Teams website and if you want it peer reviewed, the deadline is, uh, is at the end of this month, or you wait to uh, uh, August, the more practical papers. That's my reminder today. Thanks, Harold. That's a great reminder. Okay, so just a few quick points. Of course, where are you joining us from? Uh, let us know in the chat. And of course, with the Q&As, uh, use the Q&A section of Zoom. We have Victoria here that's with us uh, from Capacity Builder National. She's going to be monitoring the questions, and we will ever actually address those towards the end of the presentation today. But in total for our webinars this year, we've done 11 of our 25 scheduled events, 803 attendees from 61 nations. So we've got a nice uh, demographic that's going on there. So far, we're seeing, of course, United States, Germany, England. Okay, Trinidad and Tobago, very nice. Okay, great. And also India, I think we saw earlier. Okay, and if you are um, you know, following our webinar series, of course, if you haven't joined yet with our LinkedIn group, we do have the event page. That's up in LinkedIn, and you can join the other nearly 300 emergency managers and emergency management professionals that are in the LinkedIn group. And what we do there is we use that group just to make some announcements and things like that about the program, so you can easily follow up on that. And of course, if you have any questions or anything else that you would like to, to uh, ask us about the actual webinar series, we do monitor that group, and you can post in there as well, especially if you want to share any other information. Or even like Harold said, you know, if you have event invitations, or you want to know of other webinars or know, of, uh, for example, the Teams conference, we'll be sharing that information there as well. Now, future webinars coming up after this one, we have uh, a series of, of course, a, no a number of different webinars, but Bulgaria, Thailand, Kosovo, the Pacific Disaster Center, Italy, Germany, and then uh, we'll be back with uh, David and Duncan again, actually, and the University of Man Manchester team, as we're going to be talking about the future of emergency management in a two-part series with a number of panelists and talking about where this profession is going and uh, where it's uh, going to take us, especially post COVID and everything else. And then we'll continue on with the Smart Cities project that's come out of the European Union and also data science integration into emergency management there towards the end of the year. Now, at this point, that's just kind of my quick remarks. Uh, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to David and uh, he'll introduce our speakers for today. David, over to you. Kyle, excellent, thank you. And hello, everybody, good to be with you again. Um, so as the screen uh, suggests, I'm David Powell. I currently work as a principal advisor to an excellent team of uh, researchers at University of Manchester, led by Professor Duncan Shaw, who I think is with us again today. Um, my, my personal background is uh, a long career in UK policing, and then also in local government as a head of emergency management. So really pleased to join this professional group today and hopefully share an input from the UK. Carl Harold were really kind to ask me if I would represent uh, an overview of the UK structures, uh, policy, doctrine, legislation, etc., for how we manage, uh, you know, disasters and civil emergencies here in the UK. But if I'm honest, I'm delighted to be able to introduce you actually to three colleagues from the UK Government Cabinet Office, Civil Contingencies Secretariat, who frankly are much better placed to talk you through how the UK organises itself and actually give you the official view, uh, which I think Carl and Harold are particularly appreciate, uh, appreciative of, of, of course. Um, in their presentations, there are three speakers. I'll introduce them uh, very shortly. We're going to cover both national legislation, so the legal basis for how we do things in the UK, 
doctrine, principles and structures. We'll then talk to you about how government arranges its responses and uh, recovery, including the role of civil contingencies secretary and the, the, the term you've probably heard widely used COBRA, exactly what COBRA and the responses at a national level, how they're uh, structured and designed. And then last but by no means least, we'll talk about local doctrine and how this all works out at the most local level. The responses to the blue light, the emergency services, for example, and our gold, silver, bronze structure here in the UK, which I know that you're particularly interested in, and some of the joint emergency service working that's developed on the back of uh, some very important incidents over the last 20 years. So without any further ado, let me start by introducing you to Rachel, Rachel Ratcliffe from CCS, who will describe national legis legislation, doctrine, principles and structures. Uh, Rachel's focus at CCS is on international resilience, covering preparedness, crisis response, policy development. Her responsibilities include coordination across departments to project and represent the UK's position in the field of civil protection and resilience in multilateral forums, including NATO's civil preparedness and the UN's disaster risk reduction. She develops and facilitates relationships with counterparts internationally, so very well placed for this webinar today, uh, to exchange best practice lessons and building capability. In preparedness and response, she works with departments where crisis overseas have cross-cutting impacts or affect UK strategic interests. And prior to working with the Cabinet Office, Rachel worked in local government policy uh, and governance roles in regional economic development. So, a, a, you know, a great broad breadth of experience and expertise. So, Rachel, welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to speak today. Over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. I think Ben is just going to draw up the slides. That's okay. So, Michael, Michael Eccleshaw is Crisis Management Specialist in CCS with a particular focus on operational delivery. Long-term remit involves improving resilience capabilities and in particular, developing new ways of working to make better use of technology during crisis and developing a cohesive knowledge skills behavior-based development program for emergency crisis managers across government. And then we'll be followed and joined by Ben Platt. Ben has worked in resilience at the local national level now for 15 years has specialisms in multi-agency working, interoperability, continuous improvement through learning. His work in the Civil Contingency Secretariat focuses on training, doctrine and standards. He has a great depth of understanding across all aspects of integrated emergency management team. Perfect, so I'm gonna run you through today the sort of the structures of, of how we work in, in central government. And then obviously we've got time for Q&A shortly after. So with the, the UK's crisis management, we're obviously going through a fairly sort of briefing brief overview um, of, of our principles and our approach here. So for us, this starts with the Civil Contingencies Act. This was introduced following a string of civil related emergencies, which prompted a shift in focus. And we often talk about the four Fs here. So we had flooding, fire strikes, fuel strikes, and foot and mouth, which prompted considerations about the, the sort of emergency response within, within central government particularly. And therefore the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 is a primary legislation which provides the framework for responding to emergencies as well as the mechanism for general emergency powers in the UK. The Act consists of two parts. Part one establishes a set of roles and responsibilities for those in emergency preparedness and response at the local level. And part two provides for the making of temporary special legislation for emergency regulation to help deal with the most serious of emergencies and they have some, some clear, clear thresholds there. And then obviously attached to that are the associated documents that, that flow from the, the Civil Contingencies Act. So these are things such as the central government concept of operations, and then overwhelmingly due to our principle of subsidiarity, the fact that most emergencies are, you know, they don't require central government input. It is, it is really that local level that are the delivery partners, and, and we work obviously very closely through, through the system there. Our focus, the role of Cabinet Office. So we are part of the Civil Contingencies Secretariat that sits within cabinet office and essentially that is existing to help government to work better so it does this through support to the prime minister and cabinet including its subcommittees and that is across the range of government activities as part of ongoing work 
we engage with central, local and regional partners to prepare for emergencies and to coordinate the central government response to major disruptive challenges. And my colleague Ben will talk a bit later about the local level of that, because as I said, the principle of subsidiarity means that that really is driven through the local level. So here we have a, a representation really, and this is there's obviously many ways that you can um, that you can present the the integrated emergency management doctrine. This is just a fairly simple um, example that um, I will be running through to show those real key areas that we in, in the civil contingency secretariat focus on. So that's from anticipation to assessment, preparing, responding, and recovering from emergencies and incidents. So here we're looking at the assess phase. So this is taken from the National Risk Register and that assesses the major threats and hazards to the UK according to likelihood and impact and is issued every two years. This is a confidential assessment in our internal version of this document and it draws on expertise from a wide range of departments and agencies across government. And this slide you're seeing is taken from the National Risk Register, which is the public version of that assessment. Risks are assessed in terms of their likelihood and impact each risk ident identified in terms of how its consequence would challenge local responder capabilities. And what you see there is, is taken from the, the NRR, which has the, um, the sort of categories of, of, um, of impacts and risks um, plotted as, as you can see there with the, in the various categories. So once that assessment takes place, we move on to, in the next slide, the prepare phase. So the assessment drives a huge amount of planning for um, right down to the local level and what the National Risk Register enables um, local partners to do or through government is to really draw the, the prepare phase. So here you take your, your, NS, your NSRA which is, is the National Security Risk Assessment shared with partners and that enables the development of planning assumptions. So we very much look at this in the UK from the common risk consequences. Therefore what do you have that you can plan for against a common consequence of the risk? which leads to our resilience capabilities program, which is the green um, on the right hand side of this slide. So in developing the capabilities program, it aims to increase the government's capability to respond to and recover from emergencies and provides advice on preparing for a crisis down to that local level. It does this by understanding what capabilities we need to deal with the consequence of emergencies, regardless of whether those emergencies are caused by accidents, natural hazards or man-made threats. And that then the system works together to coordinate cross-government efforts to build those capabilities, um, again, mainly held by the local level. Each capability work strand is the responsibility of a lead government department. You really, and, and you'll be very familiar with this year, the cross-cutting nature of, of what we do in resilience. Um, we ensure here that we have the lead government department and then we have the central cabinet office coordination function. And in developing what we call the Resilience Capabilities Programme, we use the risk and reasonable worst case scenarios as portrayed by the National Risk Assessment. And it models the different facets of those response through a series of generic and risk agnostic capabilities. As I say, it can be, it is that common consequence risk. This capability um, can be described as a sort of demonstrate that ability to do or achieve something and then, and then the gaps can be identified or the, the um, additional either funding or resource needed. So running along the bottom of that slide, we look at the planning assumption that demonstrates the worst plausible impact that the UK might face. Then what does that risk cause? So that may be, for example, an industrial accident which causes mass casualties or a terrorist attack that causes mass casualties, flooding or public disorder. And therefore your planning assumption leads to the driver being flooding but you are you have a capability that is, is able to deal with it with all of those those environments so that is in the sort of from your risk assessment to your prepare phase and then we move on over to the next slide to what normally comes more into to my team's world of the anticipate so here and you can have this obviously you have this ahead of the assessment but particularly for for our side we have the anticipate scan um, phase so this is very much the horizon scanning activity so this is ensuring that we have a systematic approach to how we do this so in anticipation both pre and post emergency we actively conduct both short-term and long-term horizon scanning to remain on top of risks and potential emergencies this helps us as government to analyse whether it is adequately prepared for potential opportunities and threats and helps ensure that policies are resilient to different future environments. And we have various tools, as you can see on the right hand side, to do that. Things such as the Flood Forecasting Centre, 
and we have our Met Office that support that. We have our own internal um, you know, mornings of alerts and we also have our forward look, which is a scanning document. So we use this horizon scanning activity to work with departments from the centre to, um, to identify things that are sort of bubbling over the horizon and are the capabilities that have been developed, are they fit for purpose in this scenario that we are currently facing? Do we need to think about what, what we might need to do as a government to work together? Um, a, a good example, I think, of, um, of how so that sort of anticipate and, and prepare work is the recent, um, recent G7 um, event, which you may well be familiar with, happened over um, in the UK in Cornwall recently. And that was where there is obviously a um, you know, plan within that local area of how to deal with, with various things using capabilities. But what the G7 required was for that local area to to think about the capabilities that they had and to apply a lens to it so we had the the capabilities of the area to deal with things like mass casualties that they would usually do and then when a you know a huge amount of additional people turn up with some of the also the most powerful people in the world we think about what that local level might need in addition so that's where you use all the three phases that i've mentioned already you think about your assessment so you already know what your capabilities would be and then we are working with, with that level to think about what they anticipate their capabilities might need to adapt or assess. And therefore, it may be that um, the capabilities currently in place need an, uh, an additional support from maybe a mutual, um, a mutual aid scenario from a neighbouring um, authority for additional police resources, for example. So the capability is already there, but it may be that we work with, um, with the area in a particular emergency to adapt them to their more bespoke capabilities. And then moving on to the next slide, we move into the respond phase. So this really is a, um, a representation of, um, of the escalating nature of emergencies, but also the flexibility of, of the system that we have. So there are many factors that may influence going from a local response right up to that serious level two, which is a central coordination from COBRA. So we're now into the respond phase. We've moved from the anticipation of, of things bubbling up. We're now in respond and obviously recovery needs to be a, a theme throughout that represented on the slide. Flooding is a really good example of this, of this for the UK. So areas that are used to flooding, they, they have the National Security Risk Assessment, they, they've, used their, they've developed their capabilities, they have the plans in place, they have the capabilities in place to deal with flooding if they are used to it. So it may be in, in most cases, central government is not involved in that local level response down that sort of left hand side of, of the diagram here. And central government wouldn't need to be involved, it is within local thresholds. But obviously that can very quickly, if it's in a few, a few different areas, a few areas that may not be used to as much flooding, that may therefore quickly go into central government coordination. And what that really means is that we have the, flex, the flexibility to draw together departments that are responsible for the various areas, ensure that that local level is supported. Do they need additional national um, capabilities, which happened earlier this year when we had um, some flooding um, early in the year, by where an area that does have flooding, but um, national uh, capabilities were able to be brought down from a bit further north, which meant that they could um, ensure that those, those flood barriers weren't breached. And so it almost went from the sort of more local level response into serious level two because of the nature of needing that additional national resourcing and of course we will all be familiar that there are many other elements that may influence um, things that tick up that scale that may be political interest or, or certain international um, interests that may really require um, a central government coordination uh, for myself on the international desk for example we um, have responsibilities to our overseas territories and during the Caribbean hurricane season and um, there may be as, as many years those um, territories are not hugely impacted or it's very much within their, their, their thresholds but as we saw in 2017 that can very quickly um, if they are particularly impacted need central government coordination you know we have our in terms of our capabilities pre-deployment which is a, a standard operating procedure Whereas actually it may be that in, a, um, in an escalating scenario, it very quickly jumps into that serious level two requiring central government coordination. Now there's the, there's the uh, top right box there, which is catastrophic level three. And we know that quite rooted into that territory in terms of how we, um, how we operate COBRAs. And I think leaving it there, that is probably a very good opportunity to hand over to my colleague, Michael, 
who will talk through the sort of running of Cobra because I think what we have there is the ability for a single scene to really ramp up and that's where Michael I think will give a, a run through how we how we operate that system. Thank you. So as we've seen uh, on the previous slide, serious emerge, thank you Ben, serious level two and catastrophic level three with our handy dotted line often would suggest uh, that uh, a centrally coordinated response is, is required. And that's often, as the, as the scale on the left says, can either be because it's multi-regional uh, or because there's multiple uh, government departments uh, who are needed to both respond and eventually recover from that incident. And so that really is, is where CCS uh, takes a proactive role in the cabinet office more widely. Uh, and it may well be uh, that uh, it is decided that uh, a COBRA meeting is, is convened or indeed a series of COBRA meetings are convened. So uh, Ben, if you might uh, skip forward two slides. So, for, yep, and the next. Perfect. Um, so, look, you know, what, what is a, a COBRA meeting or what is COBRA? I'm sure you'll have heard this, uh, heard the phrase in, um, uh, you know, in common parlance in, in the media. Um, I mean, in, in one sense, COBRA is simply a meeting. Um, and in another sense, it's a really very unique uh, meeting. Uh, COBRA meetings have their own doctrine, their own set of processes, both how the secretariat uh, and the lead department um, uh, structure themselves to ensure that uh, you know, this, this major significant event affect, affecting the country, quite often affecting people's lives, making sure we're structured in a way that we can uh, respond, update and inform ourselves and our ministers uh, quickly and efficiently, uh, so often using kind of rotated systems to clearly define roles and responsibilities, all of those. But what, why are we doing that? And, and, and so COBRA meeting uh, really has some clear priorities and things to do. Uh, it's important to say that not every situation needs a COBRA meeting. There has to be some value added. And what, how can COBRA add value? Well, first of all, it sets strategic aims. So COBRAs are not ever used to tell the people on the ground what to do. Uh, you know, the subsidiarity principle that we have and uh, the fundamentals that police, fire, um, all of the responders, the category one and two responders, they know what to do, that is their jobs. But we can set strategic aims at the COBRA level, uh, the kind of big picture, where we try to get to as, a, as an end game. And of course, uh, speed and pace is always critical there. So it's not just about resolving the incident or issue, uh, it is about doing it as quickly as possible and those key principles, preservation of life, uh, minimization of kind of disruption to, to lives and indeed the economy and, and individuals' finances. So the second thing that COBRA can do is to COBRA by being a step back and, uh, and not uh, operationally involved in the response, we can try and draw the best understanding of the situation as a whole. So we can draw and do draw uh, information from everybody right across the board who's involved in that crisis response. So, you know, uh, uh, police officers on the ground will have a, have a view very much from the kind of criminal process and protection of life. Fire Brigade, again, uh, another a view. But then there will be also many other views to take into consideration. So our colleagues at MHCLG, the Ministry for Communities and Local Government, they're thinking about housing and where you might put uh, displaced individuals. You've got the local authority uh, who, who have a huge, huge role in that. You have all home office may, may have a view if it's near a border or it's an international incident, the foreign office might uh, all have views. So we can bring all those views together and, and develop a common understanding of the situation. And we do that drawing together what in normal parts is known as a SITREP or situation report. We have a particular brand for COBRA called a CRIP, Commonly Recognized Information Picture. Uh, that has its own kind of structure and, and clear branding. So if anyone is asked to contribute to a CRIP, they know that that information is going straight into a COBRA meeting, draws together all of the understanding from right across uh, uh, all the different mechanisms of government and sometimes indeed civil society, um, along with things like weather projections, maps, etc., so that we can inform the meeting with the very best information. Now, of course, in, in a no warning crisis in particular or a rapidly escalating crisis, you know, the, the picture will be confused. It may well be conflicting. We may be having different figures and numbers and interpretations coming from different bits of government. And again, what the, the, the secretariat supporting the COBRA can do is work through that, immediately spot those inconsistencies, drill back, go back to people to understand why it is that these numbers are different and, and try and provide that 
best picture as we have. In the early phases, that picture will be incomplete. And indeed, we may discover that actually a lot of what was on that first crit, that uh, information picture was was imperfect and, and sometimes it's just plainly wrong but all we can do is present the best information that we have at the time so we support the subfunders on the ground so a really good cobra meeting the questions will be fundamentally you know what is happening what is going on and then through uh, the relevant departments what do you need uh, and that's what a, a, a cobra meeting can do at the highest level it is all, all or as many relevant secretaries of state as is necessary around the table. Very unusual to get that unless you're in a kind of uh, cabinet type meeting, which are much more choreographed. This is bringing together secretaries of state or, or senior officials um, and finding out what each of their departments can do to support the responders on the ground. You know, often the Ministry of Defence, Secretary of State for Defence will be there and will be always having that conversation about whether or not a MAC or a military aid to civilian authorities uh, might need to be placed so that to uh, unlock some uh, military support but to support civilian and under civilian command. Uh, the Treasury, uh, much as they don't like it, will often be called in to uh, find some money uh, to support whatever the issue is. Uh, so very much about supporting those responders bypassing potentially 10 or 15 layers of bureaucracy. So right from the lowest level to the top level, you can ask the question, what do you need? And then very, very quickly within that exact meeting, uh, agreement can be placed or indeed direction can be made to, to, to provide that support. The COBRA meeting as well could think about the wider implications for government. So that's either in the social context, in terms of communications as well, so warning and informing the public and also reassuring them. Uh, it can and is often used as a way of demonstrating grip. And, and, and that's a really valid reason to have a COBRA meeting. It means that uh, all of government is taking this issue really seriously. It's almost certainly going to be the number one priority for Her Majesty's government at that period in time. And it shows that everyone is working towards it and also can start thinking about the long term you know not just right here and now what does this mean but what's this mean for the future uh, and particularly if you have a series of cobra meetings over a period of time um, then um, those implications are the kind of things that will be brought into the consideration maybe further down the line the first few very much about resolving the incident in real time and then it can be going on particularly when you're thinking about recovery what those implications are do we need new funding do we need new flood defenses do we need a new way of fighting fires whatever it might be Again, uh, very much uh, in terms of common understanding, it's about monitoring effectiveness. So knowing that in an hour's time, the Prime Minister is going to get really clear, direct information of exactly what is happening is a very good way of making sure people work quickly and efficiently to resolve things. Uh, so it can both monitor and indeed enhance the effectiveness of the response. If you say we need an update for COBRA, um, you better have a good update, quite frankly, and it really does really does help focus minds. Uh, mentioned already that unlocking of bureaucracy, you know, um, civil service quite rightly has has bureaucracy uh, for good reasons in terms of protecting public money and the source, etc. Sometimes in crisis scenarios, we have to move really, really quickly, uh, 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 and again, it just helps move some of those layers to make sure those responders are getting exactly what they need for that kind of key principle of protection of life and property. And lastly, that public information is, is absolutely clear. What you don't want is multiple di different bits of government, each running their own press conference, each saying slightly different from their perspective, but coordinating that communication strategy, making sure everyone is clear through the common understanding what is going on and then uh, who is delivering those messages. You know, is the prime minister the one who's going to do that? Is it the lead government department, secretary of state, or is it going to be indeed people at the local level themselves providing those press updates. So those are the really what COBRA is there to achieve. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So very quickly, uh, it's often presumed that the Prime Minister always chairs COBRA, and indeed uh, there are many occasions when the Prime Minister does, but actually uh, the lead government department, the Secretary of State for the lead government department, more often than not, Run, uh, chairs the COBRA meeting, and that means actually decides who comes to that meeting, what the agenda is, uh, what um, uh, what papers might be considered uh, if it's a slightly running, longer running crisis. And that's because they and their departments are the subject matter experts. So if it's a terrorist incident in, in, in the UK, the Home Office Secretary of State would, of course, uh, chair that meeting uh, because it's their department 
uh, and their, their uh, staff who are the subject matter experts in resolving the incident. So they need to absolutely drive the agenda and know what it is they need. And you've got some examples on the right. Uh, things like the NRSA and the National Risk Reg Register absolutely make it clear which department owns which, which, which risks. That's part of the kind of doctrinal principles is um, uh, that um, all those risks are considered in advance. And of course, they're never perfectly exactly as you presume they will be, but it gives you a clear understanding which department takes the lead and which department has the subject matter experts. Uh, and, and that also aligns with parliamentary responsibility because in reverse, it is that Secretary of State responsible to Parliament and to the electorate for the decisions made both in that current meeting and across the response more widely. Next slide, please, Ben. So what does COBRA look like? Again, this is, I say simplified, it, it can be a you know, bit, slightly overwhelming to first look at, but it's really trying to show there are many different component parts. The piece in the blue bit, that's really uh, what myself, other colleagues in the Civil Contingency Secretary and other parts of Cabinet Office, how we organise ourselves. Um, and that is to have really clearly defined roles. So you will see their situational awareness. That's about bringing that uh, recognised information picture. Our policy. So we have policy experts within the Civil Contingency Secretariat. And they're really the points of contact for the lead government department. Uh, back right at the centre. So they are very much talking with the private office and with the minister's office and with other colleagues in the department. You know, the fundamental big question they answer is what are we going to do about it? So the situational awareness bit is what has happened, what is happening, and policy is about what are we going to do? But supporting that and the bit that I am most uh, closely involved in is the operations and logistics. You know, COBRA is fundamentally a meeting, it has an agenda, it has people coming to it, it has just things to dis discuss and then actions. That's really no different to a meeting that ministers will be in every day. So what's so unique about a COBRA? Well, it's often the huge speed at which it has to be delivered, often from the incident taking place to the COBRA meeting. We are formally on a one hour notice to move. That's the shortest timeline we can be asked to deliver one. Often it's maybe more to three, four hours. Uh, in a no warning incident it gives us a chance to build the picture of what's happening. Uh, but the timelines are extremely short, you know, working to clear ministerial di diaries to get people uh, in the room pre-COVID or indeed on a video conferencing system now that we're in a kind of hybrid uh, COVID, uh, post-COVID environment. Um, understanding what papers have been written, what's been cleared requires really, really strong and proactive operational underpinning. And it's absolutely critical to making uh, a COBRA meeting run uh, smoothly. So we have people clearly defined with operational roles. Um, we have a, a COBRA facility. I mean, a COBRA meeting can happen anywhere, uh, but we do have a very secure COBRA facility, particularly for um, terrorism, kidnappings, those kind of things where it's a very high security classification. It's often quite surprising to know that most COBRA meetings actually only happen at a kind of lower level, official, official sensitive. Um, most, if we can, uh, actually operate at, at, at that level and that allows it much more straightforwardly for people to dial in remotely, for papers to be shared through through our kind of lowest category of, of, of security classification. And of course, each, each COBRA is unique. We have a communication cell, as you can see, the lead government department for that risk that has turned into a crisis will absolutely be front and centre. If it's a CT incident or if there's a terrorist angle, we may well have colleagues from intelligence agencies uh, join as well. And then, of course, we've got all the other what we call plug in functions or bolt on bits. If it's volcanic ash cloud and quite frankly, very few people know anything about volcanic ash clouds, uh, you'll bring in that scientific advice. So SAGE have become so well known in COVID being a clear example of that but also legal advice uh, uh, and sometimes ethics as well, really important to consider the ethical implications of things we might want to do, legal implications of that. Recovery right from the start, so think about how we're going to get out of this, what does this mean in two, three, four months' time, flooding being a key example, um, you know, major fires, uh, Grenfell, etc., where, you know, there, there were recovery cobras going on for a year afterwards because of so many implications for the, for the people that were affected and for policy and all of those things. And then right down at the bottom as well, you'll see the gold. And in fact, there should be 
different, there we are, silver and bronze is on there as well. So those are the people on the ground actually providing the um, support. So bronze and silver on the ground, gold one step removed. They are often the police, the fire, those what we call blue light services. But they have a direct line in very unusually for a ministerial meeting. Um, and indeed a prime ministerial chair meeting, it is not uncommon for somebody who is there on the ground, the senior police officer, the commanding officer, to dial into that meeting so that the prime minister can ask that tactical delivery person directly, what is it you need, what is going on? Uh, and that is quite unusual in government and is a really powerful thing that COBRA can deliver. Um, MHCLG, our colleagues in that department often all incidents, all crises happen somewhere. There is always a community. There are always affected individuals, even if it's that a knock-on effect on where the schools are closed, whether a hospital has to be evacuated, whether there's implications on power, whatever the crisis event. So MHCLG often uh, have a really close liaison with us uh, on virtually every, every crisis event. Again, devolved administrations, uh, everyone having a really good understanding on which are reserved issues and which are central government directed. Uh, even if it's a, a reserved issue, so that, that is something that happens in Scotland, Wales and all the islands, but um, it is responsible by um, course, central government for, for providing that response, and particularly things like borders and, and uh, CT events. We still rely absolutely critically on really strong relationships with the devolved administrations because we're still going to rely on their police, their fire, um, their coordination, their community uh, recovery units as well. So all of these things, depending on the crisis itself, uh, we will bring in the subject matter experts, we'll bring in the relative advice uh, in order to uh, understand what's going on and, and advise us on what, what we should be doing to resolve the crisis incident. Um, I'm going to come to the question uh, shortly at the end. I, I know we only have a brief amount of time, but I will come to that. Ben, uh, next slide, please. So that key bit, and I have talked to this already, but I think it's a really exciting space that, that we in government and, and something that I'm really passionate about um, are, are really kind of enhancing what has particularly COVID and, and remote working, but also you know, COVID was a crisis in the traditional sense for us right at the start, in the sense it was that they were led, you know, the decisions were, were taken in COVID meetings, CCS had had a role to play in, in coordinating the government response, but it became more of a kind of chronic uh, situation where it was kind of took over really that every single part of government, it, it, it was reshaped because of COVID. And that meant that we needed really good data, really good understanding of what was going on, not just for like one, two, three days in a traditional crisis type environment, but day in, day out, week in, week out, having a really great big picture to help uh, those decision makers who were taking forward those COVID responses to, um, to understand. So situational awareness, the use of data and the use of clear visualization, uh, the ability to log in and have dashboards. And indeed, many of those we've made public, you will see on the news every day and those briefings that, that, that ministers do every day, the COVID dashboard. Those are things that we've really pushed forward into having good, clear information, making much of it available to the public as, as we possibly can to show and demonstrate the why and how we're making those decisions. So that situational awareness piece, absolutely critical and continuous improvement, meaning really good, new, innovative ways of informing central government, informing those key decision makers, those secretaries of state, senior officials, uh, to understand what is going on and help them make good decisions. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So uh, that's the end of my, my piece there. I'm just going to now turn to Yoslav's uh, question very briefly. It says, how do we estimate the damage after catastrophe in the country case to deliver fast financial support, how do you audit, audit the accuracy of damage estimates afterwards? That's a very good question. So actually, that itself is, is, is probably uh, definitely in the recovery phase. So in terms of what I do, uh, and COBRA does in terms of the response, you know, damage to catastrophe uh, it can often be something that has to be calculated over months and years. MHCLG will work with the Treasury and with local authorities to understand um, uh, what, what it is. You know, we in the UK are lucky in the sense that we don't tend to have catastrophic weather events in the way that many countries have that can really kind of literally destroy large parts of our, 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 our physical uh, infrastructure or indeed our, our economy. Um, I mean, if you so we, we're lucky that we don't have too many of those, but if you take examples of like significant um, terrorist uh, acts, 
uh, Manchester Arena bombing, probably the most recent one, but previously things like in Manchester, you know, those do have huge financial implications. Uh, and 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 the, the say the specialists on the ground, uh, the local authority, MHCLG working with the Treasury will try and look not so much, I suppose, at, at the what it the damage was, but what it will cost to rebuild and who's best to replace that. And again, that is a process that can take month, months and, and, and even and years. Uh, and often the estimates come in simply the, the quotes for rebuilding and, and what recovery or that end stage looks like. If there are no more questions for me, I'm going to now hand over to my colleague Ben talking about that local level. Thank you. OK, great. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Yes, Ben Platt here. Um, I'm going to be taking what um, Michael and Rachel have been talking about at that sort of national level, the, the legislation, the doctrine and some of the standards that, that, that apply and have been developed through work with the Cabinet Office, the new government departments who own the particular risks in the National Security Risk Assessment. But, um, but as, as, as you can imagine, without actually having any local engagement, the the policy that gets developed, the legislation that gets developed, and the doctrine that gets developed doesn't really have anywhere to go. So the idea of um, the response that Michael talked us through there, that, that, that sits with Cabinet Office and Cobra, you know, is, is fortunately still a relatively rare occurrence. And I think in between those responses, this is when CCS works with other government departments to really understand what the capability is at the local level, understand their, their reference to local risks, local threats, local hazards, and we essentially have a sort of two-way conversation between the national tier and government and the local tier to make sure that we fully understand what is available at the local level to respond and recover from all the likely emergencies that they, that they deal with day to day. So I'm going to just have a quick canter through how it works um, below the government level. So Rachel and Michael both referenced these, these bits of um, legislation and um, doctrine and guidance, but I'm just going to uh, skip through these very quickly because they, they, they really do underpin what a lot of the local emergency services use as their, their bible, for want of a better word. So the idea of the Civil Contingencies Act um, 2004 is really that sort of high level um, legal basis from which every resilient practitioner across the country, including the devolved administrations, as Michael said, this sort of um, that, that Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, it really does influence some of the work that they do, although they do have their own, their own separate piece of legislation um, where necessary. Um, so the single piece of legislation underpins emergency preparedness in the United Kingdom. It defines what an emergency is, which, which may sound like a strange thing to do, but I remember when I first started in, in emergency planning many years ago, different people had very different understandings as to what an emergency constituted. So one of the areas that is particularly clear within the within the Civil Contingencies Act and the subsequent guidance of emergency preparedness is the categories of responder. So there are two categories of responder within the UK, and I'll, I'll have a look, a look at some, some more detail of those in the next slide, but it essentially breaks down category one responders, category two responders, what are they and what their responsibilities are under the legislation of the Civil Contingencies Act. And it really does help to inform the way that they they train their train their staff. They respond to emergencies, recover from them, and and ultimately continuously improve. Um, and then there is the joint doctrine, which is the, the the sort of current and most pertinent bit of, of doctrine that we use at the local level to ensure that multi agency partners, uh, predominantly police, fire, ambulance, and local authorities, as well as voluntary sector organisations, are working together as effectively as they possibly can be. And I'll, I'll look in a little bit more detail at that um, in a couple of minutes. So as mentioned before, the, um, the different responders under the Civil Contingencies Act, and this was deliberately done so that we, we in government and they at the local level um, really understand what their responsibilities are as a Category 1 and Category 2 responder. And if you can see the, the writing on this slide, it, it, it's fairly evident and fairly obvious why they've been uh, segregated down those two lines. You have emergency services, so police, fire, ambulance, local authorities, um, uh, NHS Trust, Environment Agency, and the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency all have a specific set of responsibilities under the Civil Contingencies Act, which are set um, in law, and they have to adhere to those. Category two responders have a different set, slightly less rigorous, but they are still there nonetheless, and they, they, they still have a responsibility in preparing for, responding to, and recovering from emergencies across the UK. 
and there's a lot of um, multi-agency working, so interagency working between all of those organisations day in, day out, and, and that's, that's sort of where government um, sits in. You must remember, as was mentioned before, that all of this is um, underpinned by the, by the principle of subsidiarity, and that principle being the sort of central authority should have a subsidiary function performing only tasks which cannot be performed more effectively at the local level. I think sometimes we government departments think that they, that they know the local level better than the local level does, but um, if, we, if we're really honest with ourselves, I think we, we all know that local emergency services understand their area far better than, than the central government body does, and we need to recognise that and work with that, that principle. So the way we do that, in England at least, um, and it's slightly different in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, is we break it down into essentially sub-regions. We don't use the word region, and um, there's a, there was a, a political reason for that many years ago, which I won't go into, but essentially we, we, we break down the areas of the country into what are called local resilience forums. And um, there are 38 in England, four in Wales, and um, you know, various other numbers across there across the country, each one of those local resilience forums is made up of um, representatives from the, that particular area's police, fire, ambulance, local authority, and any particularly relevant or particularly pertinent voluntary sector organisations. And they know that area. They have community risk assessment, which they, which they review continuously, and they, they make sure that it's up to date um, by kind of meeting with all of the relevant subject matter experts in that area. It is influenced by the national um, security risk assessment. So we do work with the local tier so that they understand how we're assessing risk on the national level. And that very much filters down into the way that they understand risk at the local level. And, also under, uh, and it also allows us to understand the capability that they have to respond to those risks um, should they need to in, in an emergency. So um, I've, got, I've got a few details in there. You'll probably read them, but I'll, I'll just skip through them. So um, each LRF is required to meet at least twice a year, but most meet regularly, have regular working groups, the sub forums, developing plans and testing arrangements on a rolling basis. And this is this is um, a really crucial part of the way that we, we deliver resilience nationally is, is having really effective mechanisms within those local resilience forums for continuous working, continuous risk assessment, continuous training and exercising, and, and then effective um, lessons learning processes off the back of um, responding to emergencies. So um, I've already said the principles of subsidiarity and they are, they are absolutely key to what we do here. But based on what I said so far, there is the local tier and there is the national tier. And there seems to be a bit of a gap in between. And this is where the department that Michael and, and Rachel mentioned of MHCLG, so the Ministry of Housing and Communities and Local Government, they play a key role in bridging that gap between the national and the local tier. And we essentially stand side by side with MHCLG um, and work through the conduit of a government um, liaison officer who is actually part of the network across the country and they are in charge of a group of local resilience forums and they work closely with them and that is essentially our conduit into working with the local tier. So during, during non-response times they're, they're called government liaison officers Oh, no, sorry, they're not. During non-response times, they're called um, resilience advisors, and they are essentially just that conduit between go central government and local, local, the local resilience practitioner group. And then as soon as we tip over into a, into a major response, i.e. if a COBRA is activated, that is where those resilience advisors turn into government liaison officers, and they are essentially the pipeline from COBRA down into local strategic and tactical operate, uh, coordinating groups. And that's how we get information to and from the local area that is particularly affected by an emergency at that given time. So very briefly, the, the role of CCS in local resilience, I think I've probably covered most of this um, in what I've said so far. Um, let me just have a quick look and see if there's anything in there that I haven't covered. I'm gonna talk about standards in a second. Yeah, National Security Risk Assessment, we've got that. Yes, I think I'm, I'm one slide ahead of myself. So um, back in the early 2000s, there was a comprehensive review into the way that emergency services, um, and as I mentioned, police, fire, ambulance, local authorities, how they work together and how effectively they work together 
in a multi-agency response to a major emergency. And the report really was a, was a, very, a very detailed review of, of, of working practices, of continuous improvement practices, of how resilience organisations actually learn from each other. And the review was, was fairly clear, was that there was two things that they didn't do very well. Individually, multi uh, individually, emergency services are incredibly good at what they do. But one of the things they weren't particularly good at was actually continuously working together. So um, there was two recommendations that came off the back of the report, which was they need to come, need to come up with some um, multi-agency um, principles. So this is where Jessup came from. You may well have seen that um, in, uh, in some of the media. So the idea of joint emergency services interoperability principles is what Jessup stands for. So that is something that Cabinet Office was, was, um, was played a key role in actually developing these five principles that all the resilient practitioners at the local level and, and, and in, in central government adhere to. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to share some of those um, around afterwards if that's helpful. So there was the, the common understanding of, of what a multi-agency response looks like. So that's the five just principles. And the second recommendation was um, joint organisational learning. So we weren't very good at responding together, training together, exercising together. And we also weren't very good at sharing lessons and learning properly from them. So that is where it, uh, Jessup came from. That is one of the things that's been a continuous part of my life is, is working with the local tier to make sure that they understand these common principles, that they develop exercises with a multi-agency flavor to them so that they're not just thinking about single agency exercises, but also the, the joint organizational learning element. Um, it was always a bugbear of mine that whenever we responded to an emergency, we would finish, we would capture all of the lessons in a spreadsheet and then we'd all go home. And assume that because they're in a spreadsheet that they've been learned from but actually a captured lesson is not a learned lesson so that's one of the things that we're working really closely with the local tier to help them understand what the barriers are to to properly learning from lessons to make sure that they're less likely to happen again but also to um to really uh, get to the grips of continuous improvement and making sure that we are have a, a, a really good effective working relationship between central government lead government departments who own that risk nationally and their policy deliverers at the local level Apologies, that was a bit of a bit of a quick canter through and I hope that made sense, but um, I will leave it there. Uh, we've got a few questions to, to ask and so I think you can see those as well. I think we've got five questions. I actually have quite a few questions myself, but <laughs> but we'll, we'll uh, ask it from the audience first. Um, so the first one, and, and I'll leave it open, uh, maybe David or, or whoever you think might fit best or, you know, Michael, I think Michael, I think you had a couple of questions that were directly uh, directed directly to you, but um, the first one is kind of more of a bureaucratic question, so maybe that does fall um, with, with Rachel or, or something like that, but unlocking bureaucracy needs a series of communication, collaboration, and coordination together with representation from concerned bureaucratic stakeholders. Uh, how such activities are incorporated into your system at COBRA? Thank you. I think I'll, I'll take this one if that's okay, and Michael, do, do yeah. add in. I think, um, and that was probably a reference there to, um, to Michael's um, run through how these systems really operate effectively because when you kick in in the cobra system it is the people that are responsible the lead government departments for that area are in that room therefore you know the comms and the um you know the, the ability to interact with the people that can do something about it are, are there in that room together um, michael would you add anything there just to say that really the kind of COBRA exists for exactly that purpose to unlock the bureaucracy uh, so there are two there was a very unique thing which I, I failed to mention which I think is really relevant here so we've mentioned the Civil Contingencies Act and particularly the part one bit about defining uh, responsibilities categories of responders part two is is a really extraordinarily powerful piece of legislation it's never actually been enacted uh, but it allows uh, the prime minister or indeed a designated official or other minister uh, in times when there is not sufficient time to convene parliament uh, to direct uh, direct actions to seize quite private or public property and to do direct any individual in the country to perform any action. So uh, the, one of the unique things about a COBRA meeting is that uh, one of the theoretical things, one of the theoretical actions that could always come from a COBRA meeting is the activation of part two. Uh, that is why the chair sits at the end of the table and not as in a cabinet meeting in the center, which is a collective agreement uh, um, discussion. Um, and what that does is that that kind of giant sword of Damocles, which is if this is not going right, or if this is a serious risk to life, we will enact part two in this meeting and I will direct you to do that activity. 
Um, that is the key to the unlocking of the bureaucracy, really. It is that direct line from what is on the ground to, to the, 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 the chair of that meeting with the ability to turn to another department and say, this is a COBRA action, this needs to be done. And often people walk out of that room and that action will be, have taken place within five, 10 minutes uh, after that meeting is agreed. So that's the key to unlocking the bureaucracy. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the answer. And, and, and since you're there, Michael, th there was a question directed towards you, which is, uh, how do you engage the public uh, with the exercises? So interesting. So exercising is a fundamental part, and I suppose that's really more part of the business as usual um, activities of government rather than a specific COBRA or responsibility. Ben and his colleagues are, uh, are probably in the training doctrine standard team, uh, maybe best place to talk to answer that, but it is an important thing. And I think the US experience, I, my previous job was at British Embassy in Washington overseeing crescent arrangements for HMG over there. Uh, and I think actually the US uh, through their national exercise program probably engages a civil society significantly more than maybe we do in, in, in government here in the UK. And I know it's a big conversation, particularly coming out of COVID is how we improve resilience throughout communities. And then maybe you might have some observations as well there. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's it's an interesting one, and it, it it has been a bit of a bone of contention actually in in many government departments. Is actually, we are very good at dealing with, especially in in cabinet office and, and some of the other resilience focused departments, very good at engaging with local emergency services, but not beyond. And that's partly to do with um, um, using possibly this is personal opinion, possibly using subsidiarity as a bit of a, a bit of a shield, so that we don't necessarily have to directly engage with members of the public however i think there is some merit in that in that we would very much work with local organizations to make sure that the messaging that they're giving out to to members of the public is appropriate we can we can give advice and guidance um you know um we we and our team have a set of national resilience standards which actually sort of set out some of the principles of what constitutes good engagement good learning good good um, um communication of risk and all this sort of stuff so it is something I'm not sure that we could hand on heart say that we're very that we're brilliant at is actually um, engaging properly with the pub members of the public, um, and I think that's something we probably need to get better at. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, I think that's it's largely universal, right? <laughs> so I think everybody is uh, is fairly in that aspect as well. Um, let me go to a, a slightly different direction because you had mentioned then, of course, the local level again, and we kind of dropped down to the local level, but. There's a question about how do you assure the safety of professionals engaged in the rescue and recovery of activities? Um, maybe Ben, that's a question for you, or, or may, maybe even David. Excellent. So from local experience, Carl, there's four, there's four strands to how safety is ensured on the ground. The first one is in the pre-planning phase. So Rachel spoke at the, the beginning, if you remember, about national local capabilities. So we know roughly what we need to do. Every time there's a disaster, it will often involve the movement of people, mass evacuation, urban search and rescue, flood rescue, for example. So you'd expect us to have done the pre-planning and the risk assessments to make sure that those uh, capabilities can be delivered safely by responders. And that does include the role of standards to make sure that equipment, assets, training and expertise are all up to the uh, you know, this, the state that you'd want them to be. Great example is the way flood rescue and other search and rescue is done in, in the UK, you know, heavily risk assessed. And that's how safety is managed in the planning phase. In the operational phase on the ground, it's all about that coordination across the joint commands of the emergency services in the main who would take the lead for safety on how they manage safety through dynamic risk assessment and, you know, an ongoing issue, clear responsibilities of who should be doing what and in what manner. And then the two really important bits that often get overlooked but are, are incredibly important to how we learn about safety. Immediately after the event, you'll find lots of what we would call hot or therapeutic debriefs with people who've uh, you know, deployed onto the ground in, in fairly dangerous roles. And that will include looking at trying to address any of the welfare support or indeed physical health needs that may arise from their activities or their deployment. And then the fourth, the really, really critical bit about capturing lessons, going back to uh, one of Ben's earlier points is, if you remember the health and safety executive were a CAT2 responder, but of course they can perform a really useful audit role post event as well to make sure that uh, you know, tactics and operations were deployed safely. So you know, it's quite a, a good comprehensive system for ensuring safety of, of responders. Appropriate, of course, to the risk and the need that's uh, tried to be uh, achieved, Kyle. 
I think it's certainly an operational on the ground view. Ben, if you, you you're able to add or expand on that? Uh, well, uh, not, not a huge amount, but uh, uh, but thanks, David. I think um, it is it is very much about the sort of proportionate risks, and I think um, all of the organisations involved in this work are are fully aware of that. But it but it's a it's a valid question about how we actually uh, ensure that we protect them appropriately, and um, just a very a uh, quick example is very much about that joint organisational learning is the um, the mechanism that we apply to every single lesson that any resilience organisation across the country raises with the central government department that, that that is responsible for that particular risk, whether it be, you know, a paper cut when they were filling in the reports after the, the emergency or whether it was a war collapsed when they were actually responding to a fire. There is a an expert panel of um, um, uh, people who represent that particular organization nationally who will do a, a, a proper risk assessment to look at the likelihood of that, that um, risk happening again. And if it did happen again, what's the impact of it? And if it meets a certain threshold, then there are fundamental, um, there is a fundamental review of the structures that sit behind that particular action to make sure that it reduces the likelihood and or reduces the impact of that happening again if it, if it were to do so. So there is a continuous improvement um, um, sort of process behind all of the the learning that we that we encourage at the local level. And, and for completeness, I'll just add in from the central picture. So again, as I as I mentioned, so central government and the Cobra structure will never direct um, the emergency services to take any specific actions. We will never ever say go into this building, collect that. The the, the absolute the, the the commands on the ground, the gold, silver, bronze structure delivering that response as they do day in day out through all of their working lives, whether or not it's a national crisis or a simple you know a, a house fire, that their processes remain the same and, and they have full control over their actions. Okay, thanks. It's very thank you. That's very. Uh you know, in-depth answer there, very, very much appreciate that. But that kind of leads into the next question of about the incident. So if we, we kind of stay at that point uh, for just a second, but what is the process that's used for performance management or used to performance manage actions from lessons learned following exercise and actual incidents? So I guess it's getting into the lessons learned process. So I guess if I expand upon that question, so if we're talking about actual incidents and then also, co of course, going up through that chain on larger scale uh, incidents itself, you know, how is that lessons learned process and what, what kind of management process is used behind it? So to say, I mean, every crisis, every incident, depending on its level, uh, will have a different kind of set of processes, uh, clearly baked into everything from, uh, you know, a, a relatively small contained incident response right up to a national crisis, um, uh, identifying, capturing lessons and then learning from them and reenacting is, is an absolutely integral part. Um, we have a number of statutory uh, uh, things, so you will, you know, we'll have a form right up to a judicial judge-led inquiry that can make, uh, you know, really powerful published statements and, and even change legislation at the very highest level. And that's probably more of the kind of types of things that we uh, in the Cabinet Office and Civil Contingency Secretariat, whether it's Grenfell Tower and, and a full public inquiry or, or the one that's been promised by the Prime Minister for, for COVID, uh, and then down through the chains, uh, um, each organization will look at uh, what they have done and what they could have done better. And we really try from the center to engender that a culture uh, where it's absolutely fine and indeed critical to, to uh, be honest with ourselves, with our stakeholders about what we could have done better, to create that environment where, where we'll do that honesty amongst ourselves uh, and, and to continuously uh, improve right through all the different, the change from the lowest to the highest tier. If I, if I may just jump in there, uh, and I totally agree with Michael, and I think there is, um, it is quite a complicated picture, um, if you want to call it performance management, I, it's an interesting term, but I, but I totally understand um, what, what the, the question asker is getting, getting at. Fundamentally, it is the, the first question that is raised around, around continuous improvements, around uh, performance management of lessons learning, I suppose, is, is actually quite a useful term for it is who is a responsible organization so the vast majority of lessons that get identified um and let's just talk about the local level very briefly they are quite often specifically relevant to that local area so that police that fire that local authority they will identify a lesson that only they as a local level organization can learn and and arguably is not relevant to any other organization we have quite a specific mechanism to identify whether that is is a organization specific lesson 
or whether actually another organization would benefit from learning from that lesson. So that's where that organization specifically will, will, will performance manage that and they will have time frames put on that saying by X amount of time in the future, we must have addressed this and taken steps to reduce the likelihood or impact of that. As soon as you get to a, a, a more national level, so if it's something, um, one of the a prime example is actually when you have multi-agency responders coming to the scene of an emergency, they all had different coloured tabards on and not everybody knew what each, each other's role was. So one of the things that we did in Centrally was we actually came up with a national um, naming convention for multi-agency, different, different services coming in there, all had commonly recognised names on the back of their, their tabards. It sounds really simple, but was incredibly effective. So that's the sort of thing, because it's got a national impact, the, the national representative for each of those organisations, which we do have, so for police and fire, it's the Home Office, for the ambulance, it's the Department of Health, and for local authorities, it's, it's the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Governments. So they are the national representatives for each of those organisations. They have responsibility for, for actioning that, as it were. And those, those absolutely those principles, those mechanisms, those, those um, checks and balances apply to everything that we do in Cabinet Office. We have very rigorous lessons, lessons identification processes um, during preparation, during response, during recovery. And we set ourselves quite um, specific timeframes by which time we have to say we have done X to reduce the likelihood of that happening. So, so it is, it's quite a, it's quite a, a complex picture, but it's, it's one that's, that's, that's relatively well um, uh, delivered, I think. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, so we're going just a little bit long. So I just want to wrap up with uh, just a couple of questions here. And speaking of sort of the methodology used for lessons learned, lessons identified, lessons learned, things like that. Uh, the next question is really, uh, do the risk assessment and similarity plans in the municipalities follow any unified methodology? And if yes, uh, are these methodologies or guidelines endorsed from the central level? And do the municipal municipalities themselves have disaster risk reduction strategies? Um, and I guess I've been, I think maybe that's best for you because you were talking about the local resilience. Um, sure. Effort. I, I de definitely happy to kick off with with some of the stuff that we that we do do on that front. Um, it, so in, in an ideal world, we would all sing from the same hymn sheet. We would all have exactly the same instruction book in our back pocket that um, enabled us to identify, um, assess and prepare capability for every risk in exactly the same way, whether it be a lead government department, whether it be just a central government department, a local, um, a local tier resilience partner. It doesn't quite work as, as seamlessly as that, but one of the things that we have developed um, a, a handful of years ago now was the National Resilience Standards. So CCS owns the responsibility for the um, National Security Risk Assessment, which is a very um, uh, comprehensive, way of assessing the risks that apply to the UK as a whole and the threats as well. And um, we are, if I do say so myself, as a department, we are very good at risk assessment. We are very good at understanding how that affects capability. We're very good at looking at the influencing factors. So we have a, a pretty tight mechanism for assessing and identifying risk. And we work with a wide range of people to understand that properly. It is also us who has that, um, that good mechanism, for want of a better phrase, who have developed a set of national resilience standards. So these are essentially the yardstick, the kind of measuring stick, which we don't force local practitioners to use, but we give it to them to use to say, this is what constitutes leading good and um, a, a acceptable practice, for want of a better phrase. So it basically gives them um, uh, objectives or goals or standards that they can actually apply, they can rigorously check their own organisations against to make sure that they are um, meeting the requirements that they need to. And one of, we've got a set of 15 national resilience standards, which all of the, um, all of the local tier organisations have access to, it's actually publicly available on the internet. Um, and one of them is looking at local risk, risk assessment. So we wouldn't try to dictate to the local tier how they do their local risk assessment, but what we do do is say, this is basically a commonly recognized and collaboratively agreed approach to risk assessment and a lot of it is taken is influenced by the way that we do national risk assessment so we won't force there to be a common mechanism but often we try and influence other people's mechanisms by one that we have uh, tried and tested and can i just add to that from the disaster risk reduction point which i know was, was featured in the, the question and um and that's very much as, as was mentioned at the start i work i work on the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction as the sort of focal point for for 
um, central government. And what we often find, as I'm sure many, many of us will, is that the language of UN disaster risk reduction doesn't always quite align to the, to the national language, but actually, as Ben has said, you know, what we have is the system in place, which means that the local levels do have disaster risk reduction plans in place. They may not be called that, it, you know, we, we use slightly different terminology, but the, but the plans are in place which is driven from that central point of the national risk assessment and developed down to the local level. So disaster risk reduction um, isn't, we don't always use the same language, but it's the same, the same goals and objectives in the UK. And I'll just add one other point, which is I put in the chat, I've been trying to put links through as we go and I see that they're being captured to share. That's actually fine. They're all public documents. One of those links was to uh, the London Community Risk Register. So each LRF um, uh, publishes its, its risk, risk register for its area, which are the risks specific to that locality. And again, although as Ben says, there's no absolute directive, if you Google community risk register and pick a region of the UK, you will find that actually the, the, the way they rag rate their risks, the way that they approach that document, the way they, which informs all of their, their planning and, and their kind of priority risk assessment, uh, they are actually remarkably similar. Those LRS share those documents amongst themselves. Obviously, they model their own best practice with guidance through Jessup and, and other bits that Ben is directly involved in as well. So there is actually a great deal of commonality behind their analysis of what, the, and they are expected fundamentally to identify which are the most uh, likely or most impactful risks in their area and what mitigations they have put in place to, to minimize those. So those are all public documents. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. I'm sure we could have gone on quite a bit longer, but I, I think we've already gone over our time. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you. Uh, first, you know, Michael, Rachel, Ben, and David uh, for or organizing all this and put putting this together. Uh, really do appreciate you sharing the information with us and uh, you know enhancing our view of different systems and models used in emergency management. And of course, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this. Was the Institute for Security Governance sponsoring the the CBI and Teams webinars. And uh, if you want some more information about the Institute for Security Governance and their role in creating uh, national resilience and different uh, models and institutional capacity building, you can check out that. And you can also contact Mr. Scott Moreland, who's the Emergency Management Resilience Functional Lead, as well as Ashley Woodson as well over at the Naval Postgraduate School. And of course, at this time, you know, if you do have any questions or anything else, you can use that LinkedIn group and you can go ahead and post them there. We will be sharing the links. Thank you, Michael, for putting all the links inside the chat there. That was great. I really appreciate that. And again, uh, if you have any questions or anything else, just check the LinkedIn group. Otherwise, we'll be um, hopefully seeing you some other time when we are uh, hosting some of the different webinars. David, did you have any closing thoughts or Harold? No, no, thank you for me. Carl, thanks for uh, hosting us very well. And thanks to the team from CCS for some excellent presentations. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I say the same. Thank you to Michael, Rachel, and uh, Ben. And uh, this was a great event. Many questions, so that was good. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Do appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us the webinar. Have a great weekend.